this is, as I say, our ninth one. The idea of these, which we began at the beginning of last year, was really to uh, introduce on a sort of casual way the work of, of exceptional scientists who've contributed in uh, research on Parkinson's disease. And we've got two such people today in Marlin Palmer uh, and Agnetta Kirkby. And I'll introduce them a bit in, in, in a minute, uh, more fully. Uh, and obviously the point of this is just to sort of work out what research they've done, how they got to it, where it's going. And uh, we're always very uh, keen to have questions posted uh, as we go through, which I can hopefully uh, spot and then uh, ask. Um, I would like to thank the people who support this uh, uh, this research spotlight, uh, those who actually make it possible by sponsoring it. So that's uh, Supernus Pharmaceuticals and Kiowa Kiran. So uh, thank you very much for allowing us to do this. And thank you all for joining uh, this afternoon, this morning, this evening, wherever you are around the world. So um, uh, we have Marlon and Agnet here. I've known uh, both them for a long time, so I'm going to have to try and behave myself a bit more this afternoon. Uh, so Marlon is a professor uh, in Lund University, and of course you all know where Lund University is. Uh, that's right at the bottom of Sweden, just before you fall into Denmark, which is where Agneta sits, where she is also on one side of the bridge, if you've ever seen the uh, Scandinavian uh, uh, crime series, The Bridge. Marlin sits on the north side of that. Uh, Agnetta spends some of her time on the north side of it and some time on the south side, where she's an associate professor and group leader at the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Copenhagen. And, and both of them have made seminal discoveries and pioneering work in taking cell-based therapies, particularly dopamine cell-based therapies, uh, forward uh, in Parkinson's disease. And I've been very privileged over the years to work with them on that exciting uh, programme, which has produced many exciting moments uh, and has uh, is still ongoing. So um, perhaps I could start with uh, you, Marlin, if that's, um, if that's possible. I'd, I would be very interested to know, I mean, you're obviously in Lund, I don't know if you were born in Lund, did your schooling in Lund, did your university in Lund, and then ended up staying in Lund. So it'd be very useful to know a little bit about how you ended up getting into research around Parkinson's disease in the first place. Yeah, so I'm not born in Lund. I haven't studied in Lund. I, I'm born on the east coast of uh, southern Sweden in a farming country. I did my... Uh, uh, university degree in Vancouver in Canada and then I went to Lund to do my PhD uh, and I did my PhD on developmental biology so I worked on how the forebrain develops and how this is con uh, controlled by different uh, genes uh, at that time. So forebrain is the front of the head that's nothing really to do with Parkinson's disease? No, no nothing but uh, then I, I did my postdoc and actually at, at the end of my PhD it was just when you learned how you could take cells out of the brain and culture them. So before then we could only really study them in the brain, but it was kind of revolutionary at that time that we could take them out and we can grow them in a cell culture in a Petri dish and we could then do different manipulations to them. And we knew very little about these cells. So then when I did my postdoc, I started working on the cells, the cells in the brain, but after we removed them from the brain, and that's when I start working on the midbrain instead. Uh, and there's a number Which is of where the dopamine cells live in, which yes. are the critical ones in Parkinson's. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but I started to work with the development of the midbrain. And then when that linked to stem cells, it became obvious that these are the types of neurons that we need to generate from stem cells to make a cell therapy in Parkinson's disease. So you so, were really interested in how the brain normally develops and then suddenly thought, well, actually, if I know how the brain normally develops, I could exploit that to make yeah. things that we need for clinical use. And you know me, I like to be in control of things. So I've studied a lot <laughs> how the brain developed. And then I try to do the best that we can to make the same type of cells outside the brain. Yeah. And then I spend most of my time actually just checking how good are the cells that I made. Okay. So, so when did this work start, Martin? So when did you start working uh, on that? So I did. I, I defended my PhD in 2003. Yeah. So basically, I started working on the, the development of the dopamine neurons in 2003. And yeah. then I started to focus more and more on stem cells in 2005, 2006. And then 
it was actually super, super difficult at the time. And I went to an institute in Edinburgh for a couple of years to learn. And I was just about to give up uh, when Agnete uh, contacted me to join my lab. So Agnete is my first uh, postdoc, actually, from my own lab. And she never gives up. So uh, <laughs> if she had told well, that's me- That's a very that, good- uh, Yes. So, so basically you, you sort of came back to Lund uh, about 20 years ago to start working on this. Yes. Um, and of course, I think just to put it into context, you, you know, human embryonic stem cells were first sort of made in 1998, I think, uh, yes. by Jamie Thompson. And then induced pluripotent stem cells where you take an adult cell and reprogram it back to a stem cell was not around in 2003. It wasn't around in 2005. And I think any came into existence in 2007 and eight in mice and yeah. humans. So it was right at the beginning of when human stem cells were, were coming to the lab. Yeah, so I think I'm kind of in a privileged position that way because I was in the field when everything happened. Yeah. So I didn't enter it at a certain point of development, I was there when it all happened. So I could yeah. also then, so, so that makes it a lot harder in many ways because we know we knew so little at the time, but it also makes it so that you have a really good overview of all the important advances that, that has been made, all the things you need to know to get very humble for uh, the research that goes on, how difficult it is. Uh, to actually control these cells and then to use them uh, for a cell therapy in patients. So I thought when Agnete entered the scene that we would do that in five years. Okay. Uh, but really, uh, we're still uh, we're still working on it, and there's always things to learn and discover and improve. But it's it's part so, of. So since, so since about two thousand and three five, you've been in Lund, pretty continuously working on. Yeah, this project. OK, so that brings in uh, Agneta, who obviously not only has made a seminal contribution in her own right, but has salvaged Marlin from going off and working in Starbucks uh, and keeping her in science. So, Agneta, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, you know, where you began and how you ended up coming to this field and persuading Marlin that, that she needed to stay and supervise you, if nothing else. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm originally uh, from Denmark, and I did my studies in Copenhagen, and then I did a PhD in Copenhagen. This was actually an industrial PhD at the pharmaceutical company Lundbeck that develops treatments for depression and um, also Alzheimer's and some Parkinson's medications too. Um, so I did my PhD there, but I, I wasn't actually very, very happy about being in industry. So um, uh, I applied for a travel fellowship and uh, I got that. And that actually allowed me to go to the lab of Lorenz Studer, who is really a pioneer in the field of developing stem cell therapies for Parkinson's disease. So uh, I was so fortunate I could go there. I was there for one and a half years. And that's, that's really where- York. That's in New that's York. That's in New York. Yes, that's yeah, in New York, yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. At the Sloan Kettering Institute. And that's really where I learned, you know, uh, everything about stem cells. I knew nothing before going there. and. Um, in that lab, I learned how to culture them, how to differentiate them and so on. And then when I was finishing my PhD, uh, I realized that Malin was setting up her lab in Lund and she was looking for someone who could solve that problem of taking uh, embryonic stem cells and making dopamine neurons from them. And, and given that that's also what they uh, do in Lorenz Studer's lab, I thought, well, let me give it a go and try to see if we can uh, <laughs> bring this to Lund and team up to see if we can solve this issue. And uh, turned out that uh, we formed a great team, Malin and I, and uh, we've been working on that ever, actually ever since 2009 when I joined, joined Malin's lab as a postdoc. And now we have separate labs, but we're still working together on really getting a cell therapy for Parkinson's disease to the clinic. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a great story. And I think it's also fair to say that over the years, one of the things that's characterized this field has been the collaborative nature of it. So Lorenz Studer, who you was mentioning, I mean, we, we still all work with Lorenz around this same problem, exchanging information to try and move mm -hmm. it forward. So, so if I go back to 2009, um, so at that point we did have two types of human stem cells, if you like, human ES cells and human iPS cells induced pluripotent stem cells. I mean, what was the critical problem? So, so why, 
because I mean, people have been publishing it since the turn of the century papers showing they could turn mouse embryonic stem cells into dopamine cells. They worked in animal models. So, so what, what was the problem with, with the human system when we, we couldn't quickly move it? And what was the problem that, that you and Marlin were facing? And then whoever wants to answer it, you know, set about trying to solve that problem. Well, I can start with the problem with the cells themselves, because I think at the time, so I worked at the Institute for Stem Cell Research in Edinburgh with Austin Smith, that was pioneering the mouse embryonic stem cells. And then we started to work with human embryonic stem cells, which I learned from his institute. So at that time, we thought that the human cell were more or less the same as the mouse cells. So we treated them in the same way and we cultured them in the same way. But just to expand, so one of the great things about stem cells is that they divide and you can make more and more and more stem cells, mm -hmm. but they need the right signals for that. And when we treated the human stem cells the same way as we treated the mouse stem cells, we didn't make more and more. It took like a month to get enough cells to do an experiment. So a real challenge in the field was to learn how to actually grow them and culture them in the lab. And and I think the mistake was made then was that they would be similar to mouse cells. Uh, when it comes to making them into the to dopamine neurons, it was the same thing there. We knew how to do it with mouse cells, and we thought it would be similar uh, with human cells. But it, it, it's quite different because the mouse brain, the midbrain of the mouse is formed within just a few days. And in humans, it takes weeks and months. So the cells receive very different signals and are in different environments. So we needed to replicate that. And there's a number of important discoveries in developmental biology, which is my original field, that we actually, so we thought we knew how the dopamine neurons uh, were formed in the embryo, but it turned out that we didn't and we refined that knowledge. So, so there's a lot of early thinking in the field that it just take a human cell and you do the same as you do with a mouse cell and everything will be fine and that turned out not to be correct and it took a long time to figure that out and then I think Ignat is the best to, to, to answer the difficulties and you know 100% control of the cells because that's, that's her uh, expertise. So, yeah. so the real so the real uh, so the real drive here was to say how can I turn a human embryonic stem cell or a human stem cell let's say into dopamine cell of the type lost in Parkinson's. So that would be a sort of nigral, what we yes. call an A9 neuron, which exists in the midbrain, with the hope that if you did that, you could then make enough of these to transplant into the brain. And obviously Lund in Sweden is extremely famous uh, in, in the latter part of the 20th century for pioneering dopamine cell therapies for people yes. with Parkinson's. So it's sort of built, I suppose, on a history, but, the, but I suppose what you're saying is that the the solution was a little harder than was originally yeah. thought. So what you're saying is exactly the idea, and that seems simple, but the problem is that the, the first step was to make the cells not die. So uh, <laughs> the second step was to make the cells divide. So there's a lot of, so what you say is exactly when the fetal cell ther transplants were made in the late 80s and early 90s here in Lund, already at that time, uh, my colleagues like Anders Birkland and Ulla Lindvall and you were involved in those early studies to some extent here, Roger. Everyone knew that we can make this work, but we can never use the source of cells that we have available today. Yeah. So the idea to make new dopamine neurons from a renewable source that we can make unlimited qualities of, this is something that everyone in the field has known for a long time. The discovery of human embryonic stem cells and then human uh, iPS cells or induced pluripotent stem cells were the key discoveries. When they were made, you could kind of see the potential and you could look 20 years ahead of time and see exactly what these cells could do. But you need, there's many, many steps in that way. And it starts with, get, with getting them to survive and ends where we are now when we have full control over them. Okay. So just, just, so, so, just so people, I mean, those trials which were done in Lund, by your by Anders, uh, you know your colleagues. That was using um, tissue which was obviously very ethically contentious because it came from aborted fetuses. It was primary tissue. In other words, it wasn't grown at all. It was just collected and then the cells transplanted. And obviously, that requires a regular supply of fetal tissue, which is obviously in the states. That's a big topic of controversy at the moment, as it always has been anywhere in the world, really. But 
but regardless of, of if you like your ethical position on that, the practicalities of it is it's, it's not viable because you simply can't collect enough tissue and standardize it. So obviously having a standard source with stem cells would, would, would circumvent that around also producing enough of these. So Agneta, what was the, what was the trick? Yeah, so I think one, the problem that kind of was also in the field at that time when we started working on this was that there was actually already some studies out there that showed that, hey, you can actually make dopamine neurons from these stem cells. They look like dopamine neurons, they express some of the markers of dopamine neurons. And for a while, people were pretty happy about that, you know, and, and there was a lot of publications saying we've made dopamine neurons, we can use these to treat Parkinson's disease. But it took a while before people started transplanting these neurons. Uh, because there was this, this sense that you could just look at them in the dish and you would be able to tell if they were the real type of dopamine neurons that lost in Parkinson's disease. And then when people started transplanting them, and this is, so this, is, this, is this is sticking the cells into Putting the them into the brain of, of not of patients, of course, but of, yeah. of animals, mice or, or rats. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, also where I think Lund had a really strong track record. And Marlon Otloy said, we have to transplant. We have to transplant to see if they work. <laughs> and she was right, because you do have to transplant. And it did turn out that many of those early uh, protocols or recipes for making dopamine urines, they, they didn't really make true dopamine neurons. It was like a dopamine neuron in disguise. It looked like a dopamine neuron in the dish, but when you put it into the brain, it wasn't a dopamine neuron. It didn't function like a dopamine neuron. It had no functionality in these Parkinson's disease models. So a bit and, like a prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we haven't tried to transplant him, but... <laughs> So, I mean, when people started realizing this, right, that's when the real work started and people tried then to look at developmentally. We have to look at the development. And this is also what Marlon is saying and what she's been studying. We have to try to follow the development to make the real type of dopamine neurons. And that's where the breakthroughs came, right? Around 2011, 2012, now studies came out making the real dopamine neurons that also after you transplant them are functional dopamine neurons. And that was really the breakthrough in the field because now it wasn't something in disguise. It was the real thing. So and that's well, actually what... the real skill set came from people who'd been just studying developmental biology like Marlin and, and a bit like yourself saying, actually, in some ways, I'm not interested in treating a, a disease. I'm just interested in understanding how things normally develop and then suddenly seeing, uh -huh, if I can do that, I've now got a way into actually producing a therapy. Yeah, and no so doubt about it's it. It's a different, yeah. different discipline in some ways. I, I think a lot of people think that, you know, these sort of discoveries come because some person's just looking for one, one particular answer. And actually, it's often people with different backgrounds and different mm -hmm. disciplines that give you the insight. And I so, think so that was 2012. Yeah. I think Ignat and I discussed this sometimes because I, I come from the developmental biology field and the interest in finding out how things are controlled during, during normal development. Agneta has much more had her view on translation and use of these uh, cells in therapies. So I think this is why we're a very good match as well, because we, you, you can enter the field or, and, mm. or make these discoveries coming from different points. But I come from here, Agneta come from here, and we merge in the middle, and then you get the full, mm. uh, full line of expertise that is needed. So, so, so we actually, we do exactly the same thing. But we had different motivations coming into it. Yeah, and and I think uh, you know we'll come on to discuss that. And we've already got a question which I'll come back to because this is actually a, a critical question to how the field is developing where it is now. But I think you know I think one of the things which was terribly impressive about your work was a not only discovering the sort of biology, if you like, underlying it, but obviously to translate that into a clinical therapy requires a huge amount of rather tedious work to make sure that all the reagents are of the standard necessary for clinical use and work in the same way as the ones that are done in the research lab. So, so many people I would say in your position would say, I've made the discovery, it's for others to sort that out. I'm now gonna go off and study another system to develop. But you were very clear, both of you, that, that this was, it, I suppose in some ways coming from the background of you know, what you'd seen in Lund previously, that, that if this was to become a therapy, we had to actually go the extra mile and, and do all this rather tedious, what they call GMP, good manufacturing practice to make the cells into a clinical product. So, I mean, Agneta, how did, so, so that all seemed very boring to me and incredibly tedious. And you seem to approach it with huge energy, enthusiasm and great skill. So, I mean, it might be useful just to explain to, you know, everyone's listening, just the sort of scale of that work. 
how long it took you to take the sort of protocol you published, I think, in 2012, and then convert that into a protocol which we can use for putting into to make cells to put into the brains of patients with Parkinson. Yeah, so from having something that works in an animal and in a research lab, there is quite a while to go into patients. Uh, a lot of things need to be changed and optimized. And this is why these things take a lot of time. And it's not because we're not working hard on them. So you basically have to change every, it's kind of like a recipe, like if you're in the kitchen and you're doing, you know, uh, some marvelous stew and it has like 40 different ingredients. And now suddenly you got to exchange all these four different ingredients to something else and make it taste the same. And because like taking you have, a, sort of a, a, a major dish and turning it into a vegan equivalent. You something to, like that, right? Yeah. Because all the ingredients- every, you, every component has to be examined to check that it's exactly. not containing anything. You yes. Have. Like making a vegan kidney pie. That's, uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, that's actually, it's very difficult, right? And, and you got to test every single component over and over again from different suppliers and so on. So it, that took us around five years, just changing the protocol into something that was compatible with a product that could be put into, into humans. Uh, so then you have that in place, but then you also have to do all the animal studies. And when we talk about a cell therapy, what's special about a cell therapy which is different from a chemical compound or like a normal drug, is that once you put it into the brain, you can't really take it out, right? So you have to be absolutely sure that whatever you put in is really safe, it's uh, it's efficacious, and it's not causing harm to the patient. So these you have to do these very long studies in the animals to make sure that also over long times, uh, you're not causing any harm. So everything just takes a long time. Yeah. And uh, we've kind of gone through that process now and we've collected all the data and we're really now at this final stage where we're, uh, where we're waiting for clinical approval. So we'll come to that in a minute because obviously the, the, there's a question here about when will it actually happen rather than just when we talk about it. And I would say in answer to that, it is already happening. There are trials going on around the world and we're optimistic ourselves that we'll start a trial with this technology uh, this year. But, but I, I suppose from the discovery in 2012, I mean, you actually could make cells of the standard required, which probably took seven years, would you say, from, from, from sort of your original recipe? Yeah, from, from the original recipe to the time where we had actually manufactured a clinically compatible product, that was exactly seven years, yeah. Yeah. So, so Marlin, during that seven years, obviously, Agnes is uh, feverishly working away to turn all this into GMP compatible and making these cells. Uh, and obviously, we'll come to what the regulators want, which is often a lot of issues around safety of these cells, understandably so. But but in your mind, what was the the critical thing you wanted to see in these cells, which gave you the confidence to sort of phone me and say, well, do you want to do a trial with these cells that you felt you had the the, the right sort of cells? Because um, like Agnes has already said, they can look quite good in the dish um, and we transplant them in and they can have some effect. So, so what sort of experiments were you doing over this time? Um, to show that the cells you had were of the type you wanted? So there's actually a long list of experiments that were done. And I'm not sure you can define one key experiment that told me that this was uh, the correct cells. But I think a good start was when we did, a, we started to do a study where we took tissue from the fetal VM, so from aborted embryos. So this was around the same time that we ran the transuro trial that you so were you're taking the fetal dopamine from aborted, uh, yeah. embryos. Yeah. So whenever we didn't have enough tissue for the patients, we yeah. took those into our experimental studies. Yeah. And we know that these cells can work very, very well in patients. Yeah. So then yeah. we compared how do these cells behave after being placed in the brain of an animal with a Parkinson's disease uh, like environment. And when you say Parkinson's disease like environment, what I mean what what do you mean? Because this is often what, one of the questions which has appeared is, you know, what the models you use, yes. are they really realistic of Parkinson's? The answer is probably no. But I guess here what you're after is a model that, that has a loss of dopamine cells and because you're replacing yes. them. The original models were the toxin models where we just remove all the dopamine neurons on one side and mm. keep them on the other side of the rat brain. So that's not a model of Parkinson's disease. It's a dopamine depletion model. But those are super important to see how do the cells that we make survive? 
how do they integrate with the cells that are already in the brain? How do they communicate with the cells that are there? And do they can they perform the job that they're supposed to do? And what they're yeah. supposed to do is to one, make dopamine neurons, two, have you're not actually it, transplanting in dopamine neurons, are you? No, you're, you're transplanting no, in precursors, things which are des which you hope are destined yes, to become dopamine yes, cells. Yes. And that makes it difficult because you cannot make a dopamine neuron in culture and then transplant it because it doesn't survive the transplantation. So yeah. you need to take it much earlier. And then it needs to release and take up dopamine in a way uh, that it fulfills the function that it's supposed to be. And it also needs to send out these projections to the correct targets. So it needs to actually communicate with the cells that are already in the brain. So it needs so, to in, so it needs to innovate, it needs to make connections with the brain it's placed yes. into. Yeah. Yes. So the, so those lesion models or toxin models, depletion, dopamine depletion models are perfect for that. Yeah. Then comes, so those are really the models that we use to assess that yes, the cells that we have made are going to be safe and they are going to be functional in the patient. But then the next set of questions that we're working actively on right now is more what happens when the cells meet the, an environment in the brain that are more like the Parkinsonian brain. So then we have other models that we adapted. Uh, so just to recap, so in the toxin models, you basically demonstrated you could take these cells, you could transplant them in, they survive, they turn into dopamine cells, they made connections, they released dopamine, yes. they made the animal better in yes. terms of the behaviours you're looking at. And then you could show that they connected in a way that was appropriate so they they yes. received from the host yes. and and yes. yeah okay so so they did a very and they look just like fetal. if we stop by this just a second it's also that they don't do a bunch of other things yeah we'll come on to that because there's lots of lots of things you don't want them to do which which we'll mention in a minute um so 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 one of the questions was you know transplanting in once the cells have died in these toxin models you've definitely lost all of those cells so so i think you, you've definitely done it in a case if you like of someone with advanced Parkinson's where they've lost the cells. But as you say, in Parkinson's, it's, it's not that there's a toxin that kills everything. You have alpha synuclein, this protein, which is associated with the pathology. So, so how have you modeled that and built that into your transplant models? So this is also where I really benefit from being based at Lund University, where we have such a long history in this field. And I work with experts on Parkinson's disease models. And I've worked together with Anders Birklund on taking a model where we deliver uh, alpha synuclein uh, into the rat. And then we also deliver preformed fibrils that we see this uh, protein aggregation and misfolding, the, the same type of event that happens in the Parkinson patients. So you inject and directly into the brain alpha synuclein, all these preformed fibrils, which then yeah. seed pathology of Parkinson's yes. in the brain of the animal. Right. Okay. So then you get a slowly progression of the disease and you get uh, it, it's much more like what happens in the patients. And in addition to that, uh, you get inflammation in this model. Okay. So, so these models are very good to, to study what happens when we put a healthy cell from a healthy donor, because today there's almost endless possibilities in the stem cell uh, repertoire, what to start with. So what happens when we put a healthy cell into a disease state brain? Okay. What happens, I'm sure many of you have heard about patient-specific treatments. So what happens then if we take a cell from a, that ha may have a trace of the disease in it and put it in a diseased environment? Mm. Uh, and, or what happens if we put it in a healthy environment? But in this case, the healthy environment just lets us know what the baseline is because we, we will never treat healthy individuals with dopamine neurons. But we yeah. need to know what happens when you, took, when you take a healthy cell and put it in a disease-like environment? What happens when you take a cell that may carry traces of the disease and put that in the same environment? And we need to study this very, very carefully in the animal models to learn more. And there's a proteinopathy, the protein delphosynuclein pathology, and there's the inflammation. And we try to tease this out somehow uh, and then understand how, how does this happen? And if the this disease environment actually attacks the cells and make the cells in the graft sick can we actually find ways to protect them from this 
So, so can we'll come we... on to that because I think we can talk about the next generation cells. But, but I mean, I guess the so one of the questions here is obviously when you reprogram cells, if you're making iPS cells or embryonic stem cells, they're very they're young. I mean, they don't get much younger than that, to be quite honest. And and as far as we understand it, when you transplant these cells, they are still very young cells. So one of the questions is putting it in an aged brain doesn't make the cell aged that you're transplanting. The cells still remain very young. But I guess the question is whether the environment the inflammation and the, and the synuclein pathology that you're talking about adversely affects the cells in the transplant so they will die off and they will be lost and and obviously this is ongoing work with you but but what's your feeling with that because obviously animal experiments you could perhaps get a year you might get 18 months and i think with the fetal tissue when we saw pathology in it that was that was years down the line so do you have a feeling that the that these stem cell dopamine cells get the pathology of Parkinson's or adversely affected by inflammation? Is this something we should worry about? So, so, so many questions in one, yeah. and they're not easy to answer. And I spent years setting up the models to answer that question. So again, we have, to, so Parkinson's disease developed over decades, so that you can never model in a rat. Yeah. But we need to have a model that's slow enough to kind of mimic the disease, patho the progression of disease pathology and the inflammation while at the same time we can transplant in cells and study them for six months at least but a year yeah at best so then and and then we take the cells out of the brain you say that ips cells are young yeah they're they're young in terms of their developmental stage but they have some properties of aging that comes from the patient they come from the depending on where you take the cells from. So then again, we go back to the fetal tissue because we know from the transplant patients where, that were transplanted in the late eighties and early nineties, that some of these, there we put in healthy cells. And over time, a few of these cells will develop pathology. It takes about 10 years for this pathology to, to start. And then it develops really slowly. So it never affects, it, it's not really a big risk that it, that it will affect and so many cells in the transplant that it, uh, is not functional anymore. But we know this happens in patients. We've never been able to model this in a, in a rat. But now we establish these mo models. So it has to be the perfect balance between a progressive disease development, but at the speed that we can actually make what happens to the cells. And again, we transplant cells, fetal cells then, from aborted embryos. And we know that after 24 weeks, they start to develop pathology. Then you can take cells from a sporadic Parkinson's disease patient, or actually we started with cells from the alpha synuclein triplication patients because they're the ones that develop very rapid and fast um, pathology in the, pa in the patient uh, population. So then we take IPS cells from that patient group and they develop pathology in this model within eight weeks. So now we know that eight weeks is fast, 24 weeks uh, is slow, uh, comparing maybe to a decade in the patient, and then we can put everything on this scale. So first you need to create the scale and the scale is in time and place, and then you need to, to measure according to that. So so, so at the moment, what you, uh, uh, we'll come on to, uh, I'm gonna ask Agnetra in a, minute, a little bit about the safety studies, which then takes us up to where we are with trials currently and, and what we know about that. I, I mean, I guess the sort of take home message from your work is it's, a, it's an ongoing process to better model proxies in the lab. But fundamentally, transplants of fresh dopamine cells, if you made from stem cells, into an environment that has the protein epoxies and inflammation epoxies isn't perfect for a transplant. But, but basically, the transplant still manages to carry on working through that. And I guess if we look back at the fetal tissue transplants, we know people have had good surviving transplants for a couple of decades. So if you start with cells from a healthy individual. Yeah, yeah. So if, if so, cells, are, cells are not, if you start with cells from patients themselves we actually don't know that answer yeah so so we've so we've established how these cells work what the principle is and, and how well they work in the in the uh in the sort of animal models so agnata we we're now moving towards clinical trials and we were hearing that that took seven years to move that protocol through to that so it would be useful to hear you know where people have got to with trials because obviously there's a lot of safety testing that needs to go on which the regulatory authorities ask for in different uh 
in different countries. Um, so, so where are we at the moment with stem cell based trials? Because one of the first questions we got was someone said, you know, it's, it, 10 years ago, they were, told, they were told it would come in 10 years. People today will say it's 10 years. It's often five years, but it's the same answer that people always say it's coming, but it hasn't come. So perhaps you could update us on where we've got to with stem cell trials globally, and then a little bit on, on, on the trial here in Europe. Yes, I mean, now we are actually at a really exciting time because these, these therapies are moving into clinical trials. So we have a clinical trial uh, in Japan that was initiated a couple of years ago, uh, but it runs slowly, right? Because you can only transplant a few patients in these very first clinical trials. So, so far, I think around four patients have been uh, transplanted. I think another uh, in person in the audience also asked if there was any positive results yet from these trials. So none of these trials have yet published any positive results because it's too early. None of them have been concluded, but there has been interim uh, press releases saying that so far it seems safe that the trial in Japan, for instance, has escalated to the next dose, which is normally a sign that there has been no ad serious adverse events or anything stopping the trial, right? But efficacy data we're still waiting for. There's also now the trial in uh, New York that was initiated last year, exactly a year ago, uh, run by Lawrence Studer and Blue Rock. Uh, and here, I think they've also, there are around four or five patients that have been transplanted now. They've also ex escalated to the next dose. So, so far it seems to be safe. We don't yet have any efficacy data from that. Uh, and then I think, we have I think they've actually gone beyond that. I think they've actually completed both their doses now. I they think. might have yeah. completed already. We don't always get the updates. No, right? I, I, and you're absolutely right. I mean, none of it's been published, but I was just going to say there was that paper that was published a couple of years ago where a patient had had their own IPS cells, so these induced pluripotent stem cells turned into dopamine cells and graft into the brain, which was published, where yes. the patient felt much better. I don't know if you wanted to comment on, on what that study showed. Yeah, so there we've was got the Japanese study, which is finished, but we don't know the results, but looks safe. We've got the American study, which is finished grafting. Again, we don't know the results, mm -hmm. but, it, but, it, but it seems to be safe, at least. Yeah, so there was a single case study of one patient that got his own stem cells, so autologous is what we call it, his own stem cells transplanted back in. Uh, so these, the, and he showed like a moderate effect on PET after one year. We're still lacking to see long-term follow-up. Uh, but what we're really interested in the field is not these single case studies. We're interested in those products that are standardized and which can be uh, given to several patients. You actually get a trial data rather than a single case data. But you're absolutely right, Roger. So far, this is the only data that, that has been uh, published and only short-term data from that single patient. And on our own side, we're really, we're at that final stage where we're really just waiting the green light from the authorities to be able to start a clinical trial. And uh, as you say, we hope that can start this year. So I know that it's been a very long wait, <laughs> but we are really there where it's getting into patients. But of course, that doesn't mean that you can buy it off the shelf or go to your doctor and ask for stem cell treatment because we still have to go through the three phases, phase one, two, three. Yeah. And these are long trials because this is not just uh, a, a, a very fast symptomatic effect we're looking for. We're looking for a long-term integration of the neurons that they can over many years really uh, start becoming functional in the brains of the patients. So these trials for efficacy would normally take between two or three years before uh, they, are, they are ended and the results can be published. So I guess if we took that single case from the New England Journal that of the patient who had their own cells turned into stem cells don't I mean I guess what we learned from that was it seemed safe because there were no major yeah. adverse events no. there, there didn't seem to be a clear benefit on some of the more objective measures but the patient definitely felt much better uh, for yeah. that. So, so trials I think are definitely uh, ongoing uh, uh, we've already talked about the difficulty in the lab of converting a, a research idea into a clinical standard which can be used in patients and then the regulatory authorities often will, will wish to see you know a lot of a lot of safety data because as you say once these cells are put in you can't get them back so once they're in that is it so if there is a stem cell within there that's going to continue to proliferate then the patient in receipt of that will develop a tumor and that has happened in some places not in parkinson's but in places where stem cell therapies have been used in clinics which um, are advertising for these therapies so uh, i mean i think what would be quite useful for people to hear is just how much money and effort does it require to show that something 
is safe from a regulatory point of view because i think there's often a perception in in the um out there that that, that things are going so slowly and then that's just because either we're a bit lazy or we're just faffing around answering questions which we don't need to answer but i think it'd be useful just to hear a little bit about how much does it cost and how much work is it involved to show that it's safe for the regulators to allow you to even start a clinical trial? Because this is obviously going to determine the speed with which the, the trials take place. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely understand the frustration that things are going slow. And one thing that's important to understand here is that these are completely new novel types of treatments. I mean, when we discuss with the regulatory authorities, they've never seen this type of treatment before. So really, they have to dig into every single detail. And of course, that means that, you know, you have to you have to show a lot of data and maybe more than than what you would normally do. Um, and for us, this meant that, I mean, from from the time when we started planning that we would make a product for patients um, until now where we've collected all the data. I mean, that's been a process of like eight years, just uh, getting the product ready for a clinical trial. And I mean, we have a ph pharma, pharma industry support in the form of Novo Nordisk that we're partnering with. And I, I, actually, I actually don't know the, uh, the final bill, but it's certainly out of reach of what we could ever. Uh, so, so what uh, you're talking here is somewhere ourselves. in the region of several million pounds just to get to the first. Company. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Much more than we're that. probably talking about uh, 10, 10 million pounds or, or more just to get the product into the first patient. Yeah. So obviously the yeah. cost of this is is huge, and you know the 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 regulatory agencies will often want dozens of animals transplanted, followed over yeah. you know, nine to twelve months to look for tumors yeah. and distribution of cells. So I, I, I want to move on to this area of, of uh, investment um, because obviously, um, in order for this therapy to go all the way to market, this is not something think that, that that you know however brilliant both of you are and however good you are at getting grants you're never going to get the money for this so to do a sort of phase three definitive trial with this type of therapy is probably going to cost tens of millions you know 10 20 million dollars pounds to do this so um how much interest has industry shown in this uh, perhaps marlin i mean how much industry have been interested in developing this as a therapy because obviously the patients on this call will want to know when is it going to come for them and you know industry drives things quite quickly but also it brings with it other challenges so so what's been your perception of the industry investment in that and what will that mean for the field and coming back to the first question when is it likely that people are going to have access to this therapy if if these things work yeah, so first of all, I think you can stick another zero on the cost for the for the development of a global therapy for this. Uh, it's but uh, th there's a great interest from industry. So and this more or less changed overnight. With when all we had was fetal tissue from aborted embryos, there's no there's nothing to invest in. There's no money to be made. There's no 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 business so that field would have never developed even if we had uh, unlimited tissue with the stem cells and with the possibility because agnetta didn't really go into this but she didn't just figure out how to make dopamine neurons from stem cells she figured out how you do this in a super efficient way so this means that within 16 days we can make exactly what we want and this means that there's a lot of uh, investments in this field because there's money to be made in the end. And it's not a bad thing that the companies make money from this because they need to invest and they take the risk to bring this forward. Uh, their ultimate goal, I guess you can have more than one, is to cure patients and make money. Uh, our ultimate goal is, I guess, scientific discoveries and cure patients. But we all know that to succeed with what we do, we need to do the very best we can. So we need to develop the very best cells for the very best therapies. Uh, so even though there is a little bit of a mix of the intent or you know the, the driving factors, we we know that we need to do the same thing. So we decided to partner up with Nova Nordisk, but there's other companies that invest in the other projects from our collaborators. The, so just the, to sort of so so basically the investment at the moment in the current status is within Europe, 
the, the clinical trials would be done uh, uh, in Lund uh, and in uh, Cambridge here, and that's working with Nova Nordis really. In New York, the, the group of, of Loren Studer and Vivian Tabar, they, work, they set up Blue Rock and now work with Bias, and, and they're running a trial out of New York. And then in Chicago, there's Fuji Film, who, set, who own Cellular Dynamics, who are setting up a trial. I'm just trying to go around the world. And then in Aspen Neuroscience in California, there's, a, there's a, an attempt to set up an autologous program. And then in Japan, they obviously have their IPS program, which is attached to some company there. So there are probably four or five centers around the world who work on this, who are now either in clinical trials or about to go to clinical trials, working with pharma or investors to make this a therapy. And I, and I think what changed is really when the science change when we when the science got to the point where it is possible to make uh, dopamine neurons that has a therapeutic potential in patients that's when industry gets to interested because that's when you can turn it convert it into a global therapy so we need to work with industry we need to work at all levels on this it, it's uh, just to bring in our stem pd project uh, we must be like 50 people working on that right now to bring it to patients as fast as we possibly can. I, I, I think it's important to know here too, I know there's a lot of frustration in when will this happen, when will it come? But we have a saying in Sweden, which is that you need to rush slowly because uh, if you move too fast, you're gonna make mistakes and every mistake is gonna set you back. And when we're in a field that's so new, as Agneta says, it's a completely new therapy. So they haven't been used, it, it's new for everyone every mistake you make can also damage the field. So yeah. we need to move as fast as we possibly can. We need to do this together globally, which is why we formed G-Force PD. You were one of the members that founded this, Roger. We need to all work together to get this into patients as fast as we possibly can, but not at the compromise of the quality or the functionality of the cells. Yeah. And this is a very important point. I'm just gonna sort of slightly uh, digress here because obviously in the gene therapy world in other areas, it was, a, it was a mistake with the gene therapy which killed some young person in America, which set the gene therapy field back probably five years. Uh, all because people were rushing rather than following what was where the science was going. So I suppose one of the questions which I get asked a lot as a clinician is, you know, there are lots of stem cell clinics around the world offering treatments for Parkinson's disease. Uh, so why shouldn't I go to those? Because you're, you, you know, you're doing it all very thoroughly, but but it's it's years away. So these you put these cells in, they take two, three years to work. The next trial will be three years down the line. I want to go and get these stem cell therapies from other clinics around the world, which are offering them. They don't seem that expensive. Why don't I go and um, why don't I go and uh, get one of those therapies? Because those therapies are unproven therapies and those will not work. There's P so, so so they use cells that don't work. They use delivery methods that don't work. They do this to make money. Um, and I would recommend people that consider this. And I have I fully understand why you consider this. Uh, I lost my mom in ALS. Uh, I know exactly how desperate you get and what you need to what you want. But even when you there's nothing else that you want than a cure. You, you have to find out the facts. And there's a, we work for the International Society for Stem Cell Research. And they have provided a guide for patients with questions to ask the, the clinics that provide these therapies. And you should never, ever engage in anything like that unless they give you the answers to those questions. And those questions are available uh, online and they are all about what will I be given? What can, you know, it, this is what you need to know. Because the, the, the sad truth is that there are no therapies today available that will work. There are a number of therapies that are being developed. They're being tested in the first trials in patients. It's a huge step. Uh, but as you say, it's going to be another five or 10 years be before these are on the market because they need to go through the trials. And, and, and I suppose what I would say is that, uh, you know, if you want a new hip replacement, everyone knows that new hips help people with arthritis. That's been shown through many trials and great experience. 
Uh, and therefore, if you want to pay to have a new hip, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do because it's proven. In experimental therapies, you shouldn't be paying for anything because no one knows whether they work. So they should be within a formal trial, which should be fully supported in, in some way. Uh, and the patient should not be contributing to it. So in the last few minutes, because, you know, we've obviously taken this journey of how you ended up there, how you solved the problem of making dopamine cells, how we know they're going to work or we think they'll work in the clinic, some of the challenges of taking it to the clinic and where we are now. Obviously, going forward, you, you know, you, you sort of slightly alluded to this, that, that, that stem cells have great capacity to be modified. So, so one of the challenges when we take this forward is, A, these cells may develop the pathology of Parkinson's disease. So can we engineer them to not have the pathology of Parkinson's disease? Can we knock out a protein like alpha-synuclein? And secondly, these cells are not from the patient, as we've already discussed in the majority of cases. The trials won't be using the patient's own cells, so they will require some immunosuppression. So Agnota, I don't know, you know what your views on this is, is, you know, the next generation, can we make a cell, a stem cell, which, which the immune system won't recognize and which won't actually suffer the pathology of Parkinson's disease because it doesn't contain the protein associated with it? Is this, is this something we can realistically expect or is this just a bit of a sort of fantasy? I do think this is something that we can expect. And there is huge interest in this. And a lot of scientists are working on exactly this. A lot of pharmaceutical companies also, right? So there's really efforts in this field. So one thing that uh, the pharma companies and scientists are working on is generating what we call stealth cells. So that's a pretty cool term. And it's taken from these kind of uh, stealth planes that fly under the radar, right? That can't be seen by the radar and the same uh, uh, applies here for these stealth cells. So they are, uh, it's a concept where you can uh, engineer a cell, which is not visible to the immune system. And you do that by, by removing some genes and adding some new genes. And this is really cool because what that means is you can actually make a cell line, which you can use for everyone, all patients, all people in the world, uh, without needing to uh, immune match like you do when you have an organ transplant and without needing to immunosuppress uh, the patient. And if we can do that, we can really make these uh, stem cell therapies much more cost efficient, right? We can produce huge uh, batches of cells for thousands or even millions of patients, which makes it much cheaper and much easier uh, to be available for many patients. I do think that's the future. So we could use them you for diabetes, say, yeah. making mm -hmm. island cells, repairing eyes, yeah. repairing hearts, yeah. For anything, I do think that is the future and there are huge efforts going into this. And as you also say, there's also a lot of efforts in trying to make cells that are more uh, resistant to the pathology uh, in the Parkinsonian brain uh, or resistant to other types of disease pathology. And now that we're moving into clinical trials with these uh, first generation uh, products, we're already in the background working on the second generation products, which will be more efficient and perhaps uh, evade the or el eliminate the need for immunosuppression in the patients. And so if we were to sort of look into the future and, and sort of try and predict where we would go. So the trials which are ongoing at the moment are likely to produce their results in the next, the Japanese trials say, I think beginning 2018, probably next year. The American study, uh, which completed, I think it's transplants, uh, will probably report in a year or two's time. Uh, our trial, if it began, would report probably in 2025. So the, the next, the bigger trials will take place around 2025. Uh, and I would guess if they're successful, then by 2030, we might have a therapy that's looking for a license on the market. Could be a, could be a therapy that people could realistically expect to get if they turned up, if the trials were positive and didn't produce any adverse events. So it, would that be a realistic timeline, do you think? I think it I is think so. Europe yeah. and the US. When it comes to Japan, they actually changed their whole regulatory framework and how they regulate these therapies. So they go much quicker to that stage. So uh, in Europe and US, yes, in Japan, quicker than that. Okay. but So obviously people are worried that, you know, have I got that long to to wait, if you like, for those therapies to come along? And and I would I should suppose we should also say that in these very early trials, the ethics boards will be looking very carefully at, at which patients should be having such therapies. And so they won't be people with early stage disease because the ethics board quite rightly will say these are unproven and and why offer it to people at a stage when actually they have perfectly good or at least adequate dopamine medications. Uh, but obviously, if it does work, then in theory, anyone who 
as a DAPA responsive condition could 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 have one of these therapies where there is early disease or advanced disease. But for these first trials, it'll be people who are looking towards more advanced therapies, deep brain stimulation and such like. And I suppose at the end of the day, uh, you know, one of the things, a bit of advice I always give patients is that for early trials with these therapies, deep brain stimulation if you have deep brain stimulation, you won't be suitable for cell-based therapies because it's never been shown how they work when you have deep brain stimulation. But if you need advanced therapies, always think about having peripherally delivered things like duodopa and apomorphine because then that keeps your brain clear for a cell therapy when they come along. So I think we've pretty much come to the end of our time here. Uh, I would like to thank the audience for being terribly interactive. It's probably been one of the most interactive research spotlights I've done with the questions. I would like to thank... Agneta and Marlin for uh, all of the uh, work that they've done in this uh, field and also taking us through a very complicated area. I hope people feel satisfied that they've had an account of where we've got to uh, with cell-based therapies in Pogsies. I know it's frustrating. Uh, I can honestly tell you that, that, that you have heard everything that anybody knows about where we are with clinical trials from reputable centres anyway. Um, so that people have some realistic idea of, of, you know, where the field is and where the field are going. It's very exciting. It's got huge investment. So thank you all very much for listening. Thank you, Agneta and Marlin, for, for taking us through that. I would just like to, again, thank our sponsors for this meeting. So Supernas Pharmaceuticals in Kiowa, Kieran. Uh, I would like to remind people, as Eli did at the beginning, that next year in Barcelona, uh, from the 4th to the 7th of July, there will be the World Parkinson Congress, where everything about Parkinson's disease will be discussed at a level which is accessible to everybody. And I love going because I like going to the ones where people uh, presented at a level that I can understand, which is often not the scientists, not today, but that's often the case. Uh, I'd also like to say we've got another one of these research spotlights coming up. The next one uh, is on July the 12th. And for those who are interested in how Marlin and Agnata model Parkinson's disease, that is exactly where we're going at the next research spotlight. So Kelvin Luck will be talking about modeling Parkinson's in animals. Is it worthwhile? So for those of you who are interested in that question today, we may have an answer or we may just have more questions to ask after our next research spotlight. So thank you all very much. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you at the next one of these spotlights. Thank you. <laughs>